John writes in verse, in verse 13 of chapter 12, When the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed and, kept, and those which kept the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, Satan now turned his wrath on the church. And he has reserved his worst rage now for the believers who keep God's commandments and who trust in him. That's you and me. He knows that his time is short. And so his war against the church is now intense. He wants to gain back the ground that he lost. And so he's stopping at nothing to destroy the faith of his bride. Even if it means going to use all of his weapons against. We heard that Brother Elwood referred to it. Now it seems more divorce among the Christians than there is in the world. Satan knows his time is short. I believe that many Christian marriages are under attack like never before. Couples can love each other for years and suddenly they get mired into a horrible struggle that they don't understand. One minute a faithful spouse will say, I love you. And the next moment they're shouting at one another and can't stand one another. I don't even want to be around him. What could it be but satanic attempt to devour and destroy a godly marriage? Day after day, couples grow more discouraged, tempted, and despair. Satan floods them with other accusations and thoughts. You're a failure as a parent. You can't do anything right. You don't know. You're a phony. You're a hypocrite. You aren't what people think you are. You're a poor example of what a Christian maid ought to be. What do you think's happening? I can tell you what's happening. It's a demonic attack from hell. No counselor, pastor, or psychologist may not be able to understand or fathom what's going on. But I can tell you, it is supernatural and it is demonic. And it is an attack straight from hell. And he is attacking every home where Jesus is Lord. And he won't rest until he exhausts every device to devour and bring ruin and chaos. These trials and troubles and temptations are known as the devil's flood. Because John writes in verse 15 and 16, if you're still there, the serpent cast out his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that she might be swallowed up, which the dragon cast out his mouth. Isaiah said that Satan will bring a flood against all who fear the name of the Lord. The enemy shall come in like a flood, Isaiah 59, 19. Have you experienced this flood? I've experienced this flood. Multitudes of others have experienced it. They're being flooded with persecutions and physical attacks and mental harassment. Fiery temptations and lusts out of hell. Friends turning against friends. Enemies and all other people that you never would have thought are coming up against you and bringing assaults and cases against you. He has aimed a no out date, a slot to get against his close Christians who have put Jesus first in their life. Does that sound like you? I want to give you four examples how Satan can claim ground in our lives. The author of Hebrews tells us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more. As you see the day approaching, Hebrews 10 and 25. You know what the day approaching is? Jesus is coming. That's what the writer of Hebrews is referring to. So much the more as you see the day approaching. This morning you may be a wonderful person. You're kind and you're considerate and you're giving. But you see when you read this word from Hebrews. Willfully ignoring it. You can give Satan ground. If you spend week after week lying in bed on Sunday mornings. Instead of going to God's house. To be provoked to righteousness. You have given him a place in your heart. And like Ananias and Sapphira. You are holding back a part of the price. Look at the next verse. It describes the judgment we incur for neglecting a single area of God's word. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which should devour the adversaries. Verse 26 and 27. Secondly, another place that Satan can gain ground in our lives. Jesus tells us, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive, forgive you. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Our Lord is warning. You might be obedient in every area of your life. You're devout. And you're faithful. But if you're holding on to unforgiveness toward anyone, then your own sins are piling up against you. And they are unforgiven by the Father. Holding on to unforgiveness makes you a greater debtor than the one who has sinned against you. You see, that individual may have already repented and been forgiven by the Lord. But if you hold on to your hurt, you are demanding a price from our Lord that has already been paid. And you can't demand that of anyone. And so the real danger lies with unforgiveness. You have opened your heart to satanic intrusion. And so the enemy stakes that little piece of ground. He sets up shop and begins his work of devouring you. Because you have allowed it to happen by holding back a part of the price. Remember the song that Randy sang this morning? Giving your all to him? Everything? Are you holding back a part of the price? <coughs> a third area. James tells us if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. James chapter 3, verses 14 and 16. James is addressing here. I want you to notice who he is addressing. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? You might have spiritual wisdom and knowledge, but if there is bitterness in your home, strife in your heart, and envy, don't think that you're spiritual. You are in a lying delusion. The Apostle James speaks of strife and bitterness. He's talking about arguing and fault finding. He says all of it is devilish and sensual. It is works of evil. And anyone who holds on to bitterness causes strife. And worse, he opens his heart to demonic possession. Do you know people whose bitterness has led to satanic possession? They begin to manifest the darkness that they have held inside. Eventually their body begins to break down and become diseased and shriveled. And they suffer mental imbalances. Whenever the devil is given ground, he works under destruction. He has come to kill and to destroy. So if you're here today and you're holding on to it, you hold that grudge. Keep that bitterness. You'll continue stirring up strife. You will be in total rebellion against God and His Word. And you'll open yourself up to Satan. And you'll become so spiritually blind and hardened that nobody will be able to reach you. On the other hand, if you're spiritual and you're willing to be obedient to God's precious Word, then no matter how injured you are, you'll show the peaceable <coughs> wisdom of gentleness by forgiving Anyone who's ever traveled to Jerusalem and see that little plot of ground on the Temple Mount less than an acre, there is an example of how Satan can get a, a foothold in even the smallest patch of ground. As you look down over and see the Holy City from the Mount of Olives, you see the, Mus the Muslim Dome of the Rock that sits on this tiny parcel of ground, not even quite an acre. Satan got his hands on it, and he built a temple to himself. And it has become the abomination of desolation that's mentioned in Scripture. He has managed to focus his powers in that very midst of where God's temple used to sit. Why? Because he just got a small foothold. A picture of what Satan does when he claims gains even the smallest piece of ground. And I'm closing with this. If you ask any Christian how to do battle with Satan, they'll probably cite James 4 and 7, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So what do you suppose James means when he said resist? How do we resist Satan's power? John says, John gives us the answer in Revelation chapter 12, and verse 11. Still there, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. You see, when you hear the roaring of the lion, 
When the flood crashes in and you're overwhelmed, run to the Holy of Holies. Enter into that very presence of God in His throne. Because a Lamb has made a way for you through His blood. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way. Which He has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, His flesh. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. When you're alone with God in prayer, you are totally immune to the devil's devices. Run to his throne, call on him, and stand on the power of his precious blood. John goes on to write, The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she was nourished for a time. I believe the, eagle, the eagle's wings represent the Old and New Testaments of God's word. And I believe he has given it to us to carry us to a place where we can be nourished. So that when the devil comes against us, we are able to fly over him on the wings of God's word. The Apostle Paul uses the word nourishing. Nourishes up in the words of faith. 1 Timothy 4 and 6. And the Greek word that's used there means to be educated. Paul wanted to be educated in the scriptures. The knowledge, being knowledgeable of God's word. And so he resisted temptation with God's word. The devil fled. Why? Because the truth exposes Satan. It puts him to shame. Hebrews says it all. Who have trusted in God's word through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouth of lines. <coughs> Hebrews 11, 33. We muzzle the powers of hell by standing on God's word. Brother Andrew, would you come? We're going to open the altar up for anointing service. When you hear the lions roar, fall on your face before God and immerse yourself in his word. And let the wings of the eagle carry you above that temp time of temptation. Hallelujah. If you're here today and the word of God has spoken to your heart, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and the devil has tried to get through to you in some way or another.